We're back in the Gospel of Mark. We have uh, been out of it for almost a month. You remember as we were in chapter 10, Jesus has been on his way to Jerusalem. And now we come to chapter 11, we'll look at verses 1 through 11, and he arrives there. We read beginning in verse 1, As they approached Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? You say, The Lord has need of it and immediately he will send it back here. Now I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, and I'm taking this uh, verse a little differently. It has, the Lord has need of it, and that's the statement, and then the indication is the owner of it will send it back to them, with them immediately. I take that as the entire statement that the Lord is making, and the idea is that the Lord will send it back to the owner very quickly, very soon. And that's also reflected if you have the New International Version or the English Standard Version in, in their translation as well. So that's how I'll treat that in the, uh, in the exposition. They went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. Some of the bystanders were saying to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They spoke to them just as Jesus told them, and they gave them permission. They brought the colt to Jesus and put their coats on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their coats in the road, and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields. Those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. And after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve since it was already late. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. When Daniel was an old man in Persia, the angel Gabriel appeared to him with a prophecy. It's been called the key to prophetic interpretation and the backbone of prophecy. It's the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Each week represents not seven days, but seven years. In the prophecy, Gabriel said that 69 weeks, or 483 years after a decree to rebuild Jerusalem was given, Messiah the Prince would present himself and be cut off. In Nehemiah 2, King Artaxerxes decreed that Jerusalem be rebuilt. That was the year 444 B.C. 483 years later was the year A.D. 33, the year of Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That was when Jesus officially presented himself as, to the Jewish people as their king. It was foretold to the day 500 years earlier in chapter 9 of the book of Daniel. And yet the excitement surrounding the Lord's arrival in Jerusalem that day was brief. At the end of the week, treachery replaced triumph, and Christ was cut off. So what we call the triumphal entry is really the untriumphal entry, as Dr. Johnson titled it. Jesus entered the city with people shouting, Hosanna! and spreading their coats in his path. A few days later, they were shouting, crucify him, and having him nailed to a cross. And yet all of that was according to God's sovereign and eternal plan. 
It was prophesied in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 26. Jesus knew it. And even if the people had never understood Daniel 9 or Isaiah 53 or other prophecies, the Lord Jesus knew his end. And so he went forward to Jerusalem to fulfill prophecy and be our Savior. Every step of the way was taken for that purpose. He could have become king, but he rejected the crowds and the excitement. He stayed the course that would lead to Calvary. He actually directed his future that would be to our blessing and to God's glory. That's what we see here. Now, if he could direct his life in such a way and for such infinite and eternal blessing, can we not trust our lives to him? Every step of our lives. I certainly think that's a lesson we draw from this passage. He had been in Jericho where he healed blind Bartimaeus from there, he began his ascent to Jerusalem. It was the end of a journey that actually began nine months before. It was an indirect journey. It started in Galilee, it went through Samaria, crossed the Jordan east into Perea, and, and finally back into Judea. The Lord had visited many towns, and he made his last journey now to Jerusalem, calculating everything carefully in order to arrive there in time to celebrate the Passover and become the Passover. When he left Jericho to go up to Jerusalem, Mark said that Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And the disciples were amazed and those who followed were fearful. His resolve to go to Jerusalem was obvious and inflexible because he knew that his destiny was there. It was not to reign over the nation, but to die for it, to be cut off. That was Daniel's prophecy. It was a steep climb, is a steep climb from Jericho to Jerusalem, go from the lowest point in the earth to, up to the city. The Roman road was 17 miles long and it uh, ascends up some 3,000 feet. The road passed through the towns of Bethpage and Bethany, which were close to each other and located on the southeast slope of the Mount of Olives. This is where Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived and where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. The road passed through those two towns, went over the Mount of Olives, down through the Kidron Valley and entered Jerusalem. As Jesus made his way up to the city, expectations about his coming were very high. People were anticipating that something significant was going to happen. His followers were expecting him to declare himself to be Israel's Messiah, and his enemies were plotting his death. The city of Jerusalem was full of tension. John mentions that in John chapter 11. The Lord knew all of this, but was determined to go on and enter the city a special way. Mark wrote, that as they approached Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples into one of the villages to get a colt which he would ride. Why did he do that? He didn't need to ride into Jerusalem. He'd, he'd already walked from Galilee to Jericho and up this steep road to the outskirts of the city. He didn't need a donkey to carry him the next couple of miles into the city. He needed it and did it to make a statement. And he made it in a very specific and biblical way. 
He was declaring himself to be Israel's king in fulfillment of prophecy. Now Mark doesn't quote the prophecy, but Matthew does. It's Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. By riding into the capital on a donkey, Jesus was declaring himself to be Israel's rightful king in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. He actively, deliberately fulfilled it. Alexander McLaren said that he deliberately dressed himself by the mirror of prophecy. He was in control and presenting himself as Israel's king according to prophecy. And yet, he was an unusual king. He didn't come mounted on a horse ready for battle. The horse was the animal associated with war and power. In fact, you see that very clearly in, in the book of Revelation in chapter 6. You have the four horses of the apocalypse, the ones that bring war and disaster. And then, of course, at the end, in chapter 19, the Lord is coming on a horse then, but not now. This time, in this first coming into Jerusalem, he came riding on a donkey. In ancient times, the donkey wasn't an, an undignified animal. David rode one when he was king. In fact, when he appointed Solomon to be his successor, he had him mounted on his mule and taken to Gihon where he was anointed. Generally, the donkey was an animal of peace, and it was ridden by merchants and priests. But this was not only a donkey, it was a colt, the foal of a donkey. A, a small, unintimidating animal indicating very clearly that he had come in peace. He was a king, and his reign would be peaceful and gentle. Now that's the statement that Jesus was making. And up to this point, and you've noticed this as you've gone through the gospel, the synoptic gospels, and this gospel in the early chapters, that Jesus kept things secret. He, he um, ordered people to uh, not disclose things about him, and he was doing that uh, to um, keep uh, things from getting out of hand and from people seeking to make him a king prematurely. And so through those early chapters, he would tell those that he had healed to tell no one. But now he's open about it. It was the time for this prophecy to be fulfilled and for him to officially offer himself as king, as the prince of peace to the nation. But he also knew that by doing that, he would set in motion events that would result in the cross. And that was the ultimate purpose of his actions here. Jesus is Messiah the Prince. He is Israel's promised king. But he came for the cross, not the crown. There could be no kingdom without the cross. That's the reason for his actions here. He was in control of events. And we won't understand these events if we don't see them in light of the cross, in light of the purpose for which he came into this world. Back in chapter 10, in verse 33, while he and the disciples were going up to Jerusalem from Jericho, he told them that he would be betrayed to the priests and he would be killed by the Gentiles. In fact, that is the third time he foretold that. Back in chapters 8 and 9, he also told them, gave them a prophecy of his death. So none of this was an accident. All of the events of his life, all of the events of this last week of his life, 
were coordinated and directed to fulfill his mission. In fact, knowing that would happen at the end of the week, when, as he promised, the Son of Man would give his life a ransom for many, he deliberately made it all very public. His sacrifice for mankind was to be a public death so that it would be made known widely throughout the world. Paul even speaks of that at one point. He says none of these things were done in a corner. None of these things were done in secret. All of this is very public so that it would be announced and known throughout the world. Nothing was hidden. And he ensured that by controlling and directing all the things that happened. Now that's clear from all that follows. He instructs his, two of his disciples to go into the village where he said, you will find a colt tied there on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. It was a colt that had never been broken in Colt that had never experienced human training. I'm not going to be dogmatic on the why that is and why this was the colt that was chosen, but I think it's, it's suggestive of the fact that it was set apart, holy as it were, and so well suited to carry the Messiah on his ordained journey. It's not stated how the Lord knew that the animal was there. It may have been that he had made arrangements with the owner. It may have been as natural as all of that. But it may be that this is an example of the Lord's supernatural knowledge and the, the, the power of his word to affect things. That's certainly in harmony with the momentous occasion. What is clear is that Jesus was coordinating everything. He was directing events. He had determined the day that he would arrive in Jerusalem and the way that he would enter the city. And actually, it had been planned from eternity. He was fulfilling prophecy and was doing that by simply following the plan which was the eternal plan of salvation. His two disciples obeyed and everything happened as the Lord said it would. They found the colt. Matthew adds the detail that it was with its mother, so the mother would accompany the colt with the Lord. Jesus told them that if anyone asked what they were doing, they were to answer, the Lord has need of it. The Lord Jesus, the the cult's creator and Lord, owner of all things, has need of it. But they were to add that the cult would be returned immediately. The Lord owns everything. He owes us nothing. But when we give him what has been entrusted to us, our possessions, our time, our children, our lives, he returns it, and he returns it with a blessing. Luke wrote that the owners did question them when they were untying the colt. They answered, the disciples did, the Lord has need of it. And the objection ceased. It's an example of how things will go when we are obedient to the Lord's instruction how things will go when we follow the leading of God, the leading of the Spirit as we walk in Him. The two disciples may have wondered about that, may have wondered how they would uh, be received by these people in the village when they were found taking the colt that didn't belong to them and may have wondered, would we succeed in doing this? How is all this going to work out? Well, they did succeed. Everything worked out. And that's the assurance that we have. The Lord blesses obedience. He takes care of the results. He is in control. We see Him in control of everything in this passage. He's in control of all things. 
and will always work things out when we are obedient to Him. We can be certain of that. And this is one example. So the disciples obeyed. They brought the colt to Him. Then they mounted Jesus on it. They first put their coats on the colt, and then Jesus sat on the colt. It was a, a, an interesting sight. The Lord sitting on this very small colt, this foal of a donkey, his feet probably barely off the ground, if not dragging as uh, he went. In this way, the Lord and his disciples made their way over the Mount of Olives. There could be no mistaking that he was entering the city of David as a king, but in humility as a servant. It was Sunday, the beginning of the Passion Week. We know it as Palm Sunday. Mark tells us that the people spread their coats on the road and put leafy branches cut from the field in his path. Both the garments and the branches were given as a gesture of honor, a way of acknowledging his kingship. In fact, there are examples of that in the Old Testament. So here, the, the people acknowledge the Lord as king in that way, in this gesture of their, their cloaks and the branches. They clearly understood the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9 and the significance of his coming on the, the, the foal of a donkey. They understood the prophecy to that degree at least. So they greeted him as their king. What they had anticipated as happening was happening. And, and they accompanied him on the road to Jerusalem over the Mount of Olives. Luke wrote that they began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. They knew that the Lord's miracles, and they'd seen many of those miracles, that those miracles indicated that he had come from God. Most of these people were pilgrims from Galilee. They had followed the Lord's ministry for three years. They had, uh, at least many of them, had certainly waited for Him to declare Himself to be the Messiah. Now they saw Him doing that. He was riding into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey. He was fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9. They were euphoric. And all along the way, they were joined by other pilgrims. John states in, in John chapter 12 that a large multitude had already arrived in Jerusalem and, and poured out of the city to meet him. So the, the two groups formed a great procession, some going in front of Jesus, some following behind him, and they were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Those are the words of Psalm 118, which is a praise psalm, a Hillel psalm. It is one of a series of psalms that was sung at the Passover meal. It's a psalm about Christ. Hosanna means save now. It's from verse 25 of the psalm, Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. I beseech thee, send now prosperity. That's what he had come to do. Christ had come to bring spiritual prosperity, the greatest prosperity. And he had come in the name of the Lord to do it. So the people were right in applying the psalm to him. They were right to sing of salvation and the prosperity that only he can bring. They were right in calling him the son of David, the king, but they didn't understand what they were singing. They didn't understand the kind of king he was. They failed to understand how he would establish salvation and how 
The psalm applied to Jesus. Later, the psalm describes him as the stone which the builders rejected. They were thinking of him as a typical king, as a powerful political ruler who could marshal an army and crush the Romans. That's what they were hoping for, anticipating. Anticipating him bringing material prosperity by force. They failed to understand the meaning of the psalm about him, just as they failed to understand the significance of the donkey he rode. It was an animal of peace. And he was the prince of peace. He did come to bring peace, but not by the sword, by the cross, by being the stone which the builders rejected, by being cut off. So he came to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover and then become our Passover, making atonement for sin through his own blood and making peace with God. The crowds missed that even though the great prophecy of the 70 weeks in Daniel 9 speaks of his work on the cross, it prophesied that, declared that in the 69th week, Messiah the Prince would make atonement for iniquity. But they were looking for a different Messiah. They, they wanted a Jewish Caesar. And so their excitement was galvanized by a false expectation. Now that's the foundation of a false faith. Thinking about that, I couldn't help but think about Pliable in Pilgrim's Progress. You know the story and how it begins. Christian has this burden of sin on his back and his great concern is how that can be removed. And so he, he leaves the city of destruction and begins to go toward the wicket gate. And he's joined by Pliable. Pliable is the only one in the city that's interested in what he was doing. And he joins him on his journey toward the celestial city. Christian's very concerned to remove that burden of sin. Pliable has no interest in that. He wants to know all about the good and glorious things that await them in the city, uh, the celestial city, when suddenly they fall into a bog. They fall into the slough of despond. They thrash around in and finally are able to crawl out. And when they do, Pliable is very upset, disgusted with what has happened. That wasn't what he had planned on. That wasn't what he was expecting. He didn't realize, as Paul said, it's through many tribulations that we enter the kingdom of God. And so he abandons the journey and goes back. And Christian goes on by himself. The false expectations are the foundation of a weak, if not false, faith. And we see that in these people. We see that as a result. Well, when the road over the Mount of Olives reached the, the place where Jerusalem and the temple came into view across the Kidron Valley, Luke wrote that Jesus saw the city and wept over it. The word wept can be translated wailed. So this wasn't quiet weeping. This wasn't some private experience he had. This was, uh, seems to have been public. The Lord burst into tears when he saw Jerusalem because he knew its end. He knew the nature of all of this, the lack of faith in all of this. He knew what awaited him there. He knew the unbelief, and so he prophesied its judgment. That's why he wept. They will not leave one stone upon another, he said, speaking of the Romans, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Luke chapter 19, verses 43 and 44. Well, they had reason to recognize it, reason to recognize their visitation, reason to recognize his visit to them. They had prophecies. They had Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, the prophecy of the 69th week giving the, the time of the Lord's entry into Jerusalem. And 
his presentation as king. The irony is because they did not know the prophecy or their leaders rejected the prophecy, they fulfilled the prophecy and he was cut off. As a result, terrible judgment would come on the nation. When people have light, are given the truth, and in Israel's case, given it repeatedly and clearly, then reject it or ignore it, the end will be hard. It will be hard, but it will be just. So this is how the Lord entered Jerusalem on a small donkey with tears on his face, without joy, untriumphant, knowing judgment was coming on the city and on the excited crowds. When he arrived, he, he went to the temple, not as a pilgrim to worship, but as Lord to inspect the condition of his father's house and prepare for what he would do the next day. What he saw was what he had seen before. His father's house had been turned into an oriental market filled with merchants and money changers doing business. So after taking uh, the measure of the place, he left and returned to Bethany on the other side of the Mount of Olives. The day that was filled with enthusiasm ended, ended quietly, but as one writer put it, it was the quiet before the storm. The nation had many blessings, many prophecies and opportunities to prepare their hearts for the Lord, for His coming, for His visit, to be looking for Him in light of, of Scripture, of Isaiah 53, of Daniel chapter 9. They had many opportunities, but they failed. There was great interest in the Messiah, but not according to Scripture. Not fully, not, not correctly. So they didn't recognize the time of their visitation. They didn't recognize what was happening. There's a lesson in that for us. It's a lesson that's given throughout the Bible. And that is opportunity for blessing is there. But not forever. It ends. So it is urgent to respond in faith and obedience. That's, that's the reason given in both the Old and the New Testaments. In, in both, we find the warning. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Respond. Israel didn't. Many in the crowd recognized Jesus as king. They saw His fulfillment of prophecy in the way He entered the city. But they didn't understand the kind of king he is. Others, the, the priests and the leaders, rejected him outright, altogether. Now you might object in their favor that, that some prophecies, while there are many prophecies given, some of those prophecies are not at all clear and are even obscure. Daniel 9, the prophecy of the 70 weeks, which focuses in on the 69th week when these events occurred, is, is difficult. And what one might argue that, and it's true, it is difficult. It takes careful study. In fact, someone might object that if you add up the years according to our calendar of 365 days in a year, it comes to a different date from the year AD 33. In fact, it's it's actually later than that. But the ancient Jewish calendar and other calendars of the ancient world didn't have 365 days in a year. They had 360 days. And according to that, it comes to the exact time of the Lord's entry into Jerusalem. As for being hard to understand, some scripture is. There are a lot of passages that are difficult passages to understand. 
as I said, it requires diligent study. But, but that doesn't mean that it is beyond us. It's not. God, God's revelation is light. It's not darkness. It rewards study. And, and what a great blessing this passage gives us who believe it, who, who hear and do not harden our hearts. It is fulfilled prophecy and proves the truth of the gospel and the greatness of Christ. Who he is. He controlled his destiny and did so for our good so that he would go to the cross for his people and our salvation. Now, if he controlled his destiny for our good, don't you think he can control our destinies by governing the events of our lives and control it well and for our good? He can, and he does that. Christians are under his constant sovereign care. We can trust him and know he will bless our obedience always. We can give our lives to him and know that he will give them back to us better. He owns them anyway. Abraham Kuyper was a Dutch theologian, lived at the end of the 19th century, the first decades of the 20th century. He had a statement that's often quoted. His statement is, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not say, mine. And the more we yield to that, the more we believe it and yield to his ownership of us, the greater the blessing is for each of us. Well, that's a lesson we have here from our passage. As for Daniel 9 and its difficulty to understand, Dr. Donald Campbell former president of Dallas Theological Seminary and one of my professors told the story of a Jew who did understand the prophecy, at least partly. Leopold Cohen was a European rabbi who studied the prophecy and concluded this, the, the Messiah must have come based on that must have come before the year 70 A.D. and the destruction of the temple. What could this mean, he wondered. It was a crisis for him, and so he prayed, Psalm 119, verse 18, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. He prayed that, and then he spoke with other rabbis about this. They rejected what he had to say. They even ostracized him. One rabbi told him, go to New York and you'll find the Messiah there. I don't know if the rabbi believed that or he was just telling him, uh, leave, get lost. Well, he left Europe. He sold his possessions, booked uh, his passage, and came to America hoping to find light, hoping to find the Messiah. And while wandering the streets of New York, he heard some singing. He followed it to a building, went in, and he heard the gospel. He received Christ. He found Messiah the Prince in New York. He began preaching and later founded the American Board of Missions to the Jews. It's now named Chosen People Ministries. That began from the study of Daniel 9, verses 20 through 25, the key to prophetic interpretation. If you cannot see the fulfillment of prophecy in Mark 11 or the truth of Daniel 9, ask the Lord to open your eyes. Only He can do that. And you will see that Jesus is God's Son who became man and died for our sins so that all who trust in Him are saved through faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone. God help you to do that if you've not believed it. And if you have, 
Consider this great text. Jesus directed His steps at every point, was in absolute control, and is. Rest in that. Yield to that. He blesses you for it. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this text of Scripture and that records this great and important event in our Lord's life and in the life of the nation. Then we do see His control of things, His direction of things, all for our good at His cost. And we can know that today as we live under His care, He guides and directs us. And we can rest in that And know that as we obey, He blesses us. You bless us. The triune God blesses us. I thank You for Your grace that's brought us into such a relationship. May we know it better and follow You more faithfully. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.